What a day that will be. May I invite us to open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 11. While you're finding your place there, let me give a brief introduction of the text that is before us. Have you ever considered what it will be like? Have you ever thought about what it would be like when we're standing before Jesus? Standing before his throne. As the song says, what a day that will be when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, when we're in his presence, standing before his throne. The joy unspeakable as we are in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word. As we think on the subject today, standing before the throne. Revelation, the fourth chapter, verses one and following. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was like unto, uh, like upon a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeding lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast like a face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had, and each of them, six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Thank you and we may be seated. Chapter 4 naturally opens after chapter 2 and 3 is closed, right? <laughs> and uh, we are in the midst of looking at, in a punctuated fashion throughout the Scripture, in prophetic text that I believe would be a challenge and encouragement for us. Uh, it's been a number of years since we went through the book of the Revelation verse by verse and chapter by chapter uh, in, from the pulpit, message after message after message. I've had the privilege of doing that about eight or ten times in the past less than 100 years. But I'm going back just trying to find those texts that I believe would be a challenge and encouragement to us. But after the second and third chapter, where John is, has been given the words from the Lord Jesus, what to write, in relationship to the seven churches of Asia Minor, the seven churches that, uh, and the last one that you see in the Revelation text in Revelation 3, the last church of the seven was the Laodicean church. And this is the church that I believe represents the age in which we're living today, a church that's lukewarm, a church that's not on fire. Uh, the uh, fourth chapter, the scene is in glory. And uh, as I've said before, and you'll hear me say a number of times as we, in any time we look at a Revelation text, it's an interesting chronology in the book of the Revelation. There's a scene on earth and then a scene in heaven, a scene on earth, a scene in heaven, but it's always chronologically moving forward. 
That's one of the major problems that most have in in the interpretation of the book of the Revelation is not recognizing that it is uh, chronological and that it moves from a scene in heaven to a scene on earth and so forth throughout the entire uh, book of Revelation. Chapter 4 opens with that scene in glory. The church is no longer uh, on earth, but the church is in heaven because as you see in the first verse, it is a good uh, punctuated point that talks about the rapture in that first verse in the fourth chapter. You find in the book of the Revelation, uh, in the first three chapters, the church is mentioned some 19 times, 19 times. But after the third chapter in the book of the Revelation, the next event that you find on the calendar of God is the rapture of the church. And after the rapture of the church, as you see in Revelation chapter 4, uh, through the balance of Revelation, the church is not mentioned again until chapter 19 and following. May I remind us that we're in that parentheses period of time, the church age, uh, the day of grace, and we do not know that length of time. The day of grace, the church age, could end at any time. The next thing on the calendar of God is the rapture of the church, where his bride is taken to glory. And you'll recall, and if you have studied the book of the Revelation, but I'll just simply remind us, chapter 1, verse 19, gives the outline for the entire book of the Revelation text. In the 19th verse of chapter 1, the entire outline is there. John is told to write the things which thou had seen. This refers to the vision that John has been given by Jesus, of the exalted, glorified Lord Jesus Christ in verses 1 through 18 in chapter 1. And then these, the things which are, that's chapter 2 and 3, the Revelation text dealing with the seven churches that represent it. And may I remind us this overview of the church age span, the church age in history, is what I believe from the day of Pentecost to the rapture of the church. And it's referring to the things that shall be hereafter in verse 1, verse 19 of chapter 1. This covers chapter 4 through chapter 22 and the thing that shall be hereafter according to simply the overview of the book of the Revelation for us to get a little handle on uh, where we're breaking in at chapter 4 and talking about standing before the throne. May I remind us as we look at this text, we're talking about that day after the rapture of the church when the child of God, the Christian, the ones that are born again, blood-bought, Bible-saved, will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and will be before the throne of Jesus. And as you'll see in the text in chapter 4 and 5, by the way, you see a wonderful uh, picture there of the Christian around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ singing before the throne and casting our crowns, our rewards, before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. The events of chapter 4, after the rapture of the church, and may I remind us one day and one day very soon, if you're saved, we'll stand around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ with joy unspeakable in seeing Jesus face to face. There are about four things that I want us to notice in this study this morning. I want us to notice, first of all, we'll see the heavenly throne. We'll look at the heavenly throne revealed, the heavenly throne uh, throng reviewed, and the heavenly theme recorded as we look at our study today. In verse 1, 2, and 3, the heavenly throne revealed, the heavenly throne revealed. Notice the scripture says, notice first of all what I call the powerful call, and after this, that is after the events found in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, and after this I looked and behold, the word behold is simply a word that means look intently and see, and behold, look intently and see, the scripture says, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were, that's a simile, didn't say the first voice that he heard was a trumpet, but as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. I want us to notice two or three things, in particular the vo- uh, vision and the voice in that text. After this, after the message had been given to the seven churches by the Lord Jesus Christ, I looked and behold, the door was open in heaven. Have you ever wondered, have you ever thought about what it would be like during the days of the tribulation for the Christian? I understand, and I've talked about it before, there are a lot of folks that will say, a lot of Christians, many theologians have misinterpreted, misunderstood the scripture, and that tell us that the Christian will go through part of or all of the tribulation. It's simply not so. 
the Christian will be raptured out, suddenly seized, taken out of this little world before the tribulation. And we're standing there in glory with the Lord Jesus Christ. The words there, open door, is indicative of the fact that there is access, access, direct access, that the child of God, the Christian, has to the Lord Jesus Christ. John sees that door open in heaven, giving access for every believer. The door is open, basically saying, welcome. The invitation is complete. It is welcoming for the child of God. It is a welcome, open door for every child of God, everyone that said yes to Jesus Christ. John, in his vision, is given a glimpse of glory for the believer. The question must be asked and begs to be answered, are you prepared to meet the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you said yes to Christ as Savior and as Lord? Do you know him as Savior? The door is open. Access is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. One grand, glorious day. We'll be suddenly seized, snatched out of this old world, and we'll be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in the text we find also not only the vision that he sees, but notice the voice. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me. And may I remind us, it is very, very clear in relationship to that. You need not turn to it, but let me just read it for our edification. In the uh, text in First uh, Thessalonians, the fourth chapter of First Thessalonians, verse 16, 17, and 18, we find uh, these words in the Scripture that I believe have evidentiary uh, pointing to the rapture of the church. Uh, verse 16 of chapter uh, four, I'm sorry, yeah, chapter four of First Thessalonians, sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It is that sound of the trumpet. I tell folks many times, there are a lot of people that are talking about signs, looking for the signs. What There's not a sign that must be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. I tell people all the time we need to get our ears tuned to the sound and stop looking for the signs because Jesus Christ could snatch us out of this old world at any moment. And that's the voice that uh, John hears in this text. It's the voice as of a trumpet, the Scripture says. It is speaking of that clarity. It is talking about the conciseness. It is talking about that commanding voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, come up hither. It is speaking of the voice of the Lord Jesus. In fact, you can go to John chapter 10 and find in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John where John is talking about, for the believer, we hear his voice, speaking of the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we follow him and the voice of another, a different kind, another shepherd we do not follow. It is hearing the voice of Jesus Christ. And may I remind us, I believe, that it's time that we as Christians start focusing on the fact that one day, very, very soon, we'll be suddenly snatched out of this old world, seized in the rapture of the church, and we'll hear that voice. Hear that voice. It's an amazing thing to me, and many have analyzed it and looked at it. Can you imagine on the day of the rapture of the church where the Christians are suddenly seized and snatched out of this old world? It's only the Christian that will hear the voice that says, come up hither. It's only the child of God that has their uh, ears tuned, if you will, their heart relationship to Jesus Christ, the ears tuned in to hearing that voice when it says, come up hither. It is clear. It is commanding. You can listen to any of the instruments in any orchestra, in any band, and a trumpet is very, very clear. It doesn't sound like a clarinet. A trumpet does not sound like a trombone. A trumpet does not sound like any other instrument. A trumpet sound is very, very clear. And it's speaking of that concise clarity in the commanding voice of the Lord Jesus Christ that John here says, come up hither. It is a voice that is unmistakable. We will hear that voice and we'll respond. Not only do we see the powerful call, but I want us to notice the purposeful commitment. The purposeful commitment. John says, which said... Come, that's an invitation. Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must, not maybe, not perhaps, but must be hereafter. John in this vision is shown all of the horror of the events of the days of the tribulation. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I've been fascinated by that for many, many years in the study of the Revelation text. John has shown the horror of all that's going to take place in the days of the tribulation. Keep in mind, the door is open. Access is available. The child of God is there. And John is being shown everything that is going to take place hereafter, the Scripture says. Those things that's going to happen during the days of the tribulation. He'll be shown the wrath of God being poured out upon a Christless humanity. The rapture of the church, then the ruin of the cosmos. Time the rapture takes place, the man of sin, the Antichrist, will step on the scene, and then the days of the tribulation will be set forth and will be dark, devastating, and a time of doom and catastrophe. God has a plan, and it's going to happen just as he said. May I remind us, not only do we see the powerful call and the purposeful commitment, but notice the presence of Christ. The presence of Christ in verse 2 and 3. And immediately, John says, immediately I was in the Spirit. John is caught up in the very abode of God. He's caught up in the Spirit to the very portals of glory. He's shown the throne of God. And that throne of God, seated on the throne, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. But may I remind us as we look at these brief words in verse 2 and 3, there are about four or five things very quickly that I want us to go over for us to get a grasp on what this text is saying to us. Notice, first of all, the position of the one that's seated on the throne, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. The word throne, throne us. It indicates their power and position. It indicates authority. It is talking about majesty and control. In the book of the Revelation, we see Jesus in all of his majesty, in all of his power, in all of his position, in total control of all of the universe. Nothing is going to rise. Nothing is out of his control. He is in total, absolute control. Jesus Christ in control, there in glory, as he is in control even today. Man might think that somehow, some way, he's an authority in this old world. Man may think that somehow, some way, in the world today, that man is in control. The politicians feel that. Nancy Pelosi feels that today. She feels that some calls it her Cheerios. She's in control. But I want to announce to Congress in Washington, I want to announce to everyone in the halls of the House and the Senate that Jesus Christ, God, seated on the throne, he is in control of this old world. You may make your plans. You may make your decisions. You may put into law those things that will be dooming and devastating and dark for the Christian world. You may think that you're in control, but Jesus Christ is still on the throne. He's never abrogated his authority. He's never been removed from the throne. He is seated as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's his position. But I want you to notice his person and one that sat on the throne the scripture says, John here is looking at the very face of the Lord Jesus Christ. John is looking at, in the very presence of Jesus Christ, he's looking at the one, notice, didn't say the three, but the one that's seated on the throne. We don't serve three gods. We talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's the triunity of the Godhead. That's the triune Godhead. We refer to it as the Trinity. Islam mocks and makes fun of the Christian today, saying that we serve multiple gods because we talk about the Trinity, the triune Godhead. May I remind us, the Scripture says that in Christ dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's Jesus Christ that is God, and it's Jesus Christ that's seated upon the throne. That's the person, not three gods, just one, and his name is Jesus Christ. May I remind us, ladies and gentlemen, when that door is open and we're caught up in the glory, the very first face that we shall see is the face of that one that died for you and for me, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I don't know about you, but it should cause the Christian to get a little homesick <laughs> in the realization of what we have before us as we leave this old world. Jesus is described here in all of his grandeur, in all of his glory, in all of his beauty. We see his position and his person, but notice his purity in that third verse. And he that sat was to look upon, look upon like a jasper. A jasper is translucent. It's clear, suggesting the purity of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus in his purity and holiness is about to judge the universe. And it's pointing out here his power, his position, his purity in his judgment of this old world. 
We're in glory, but he's about to execute judgment in his wrath. Thumas, the white hot anger being poured out upon a world that said no to Jesus Christ, God's son. May I remind us, God, Jesus Christ, is the one that's in heaven. But in heaven, every Christian will be standing before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but as my mind uh, views that, I relish the thought that this old world is not that all that we have, not all that's offered for the child of God. What we find in the world today is pain and problem and difficulty and dissipation of health and life and all that we hold on to in this old world. But one day it'll all be released and we'll stand before the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his purity, all of his position of power in his person. We see the power then, and a sardine stone. A sardine stone is blood red, suggests the sacrifice for the, and the blood of Jesus Christ that shed on Calvary's cross for your sins and for mine. And the power to judge the lost world through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see his piety, or his pity. Notice there. And there was a rainbow about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. An emerald is beautiful, it's reflective, it's colorful, and it's beautiful. Keep in mind, you remember, the rainbow was placed in the sky as God's promise, his covenant, that he'd not destroy the world by flood ever again. Sad to see, ladies and gentlemen, today, where you've got the Sodomite group parading across America, with the rainbow-colored flag. I was delighted to find that when they were attempting to fly the rainbow-colored flag, the sodomite LGBTQ flag, just beneath the American flag at the U.S. Embassy, President Trump said, remove it, remove it. It will not be flown with the American flag. I'm delighted that he takes a stand like that. I'm delighted that we have a president today that's uh, willing to face the darts of the enemy every day as he moves forward in trying to carry out what he believes to be honorable for a nation that today is being moved further and further away from the centrality of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Generally, a rainbow appears after a storm. Here we see the rainbow before the storm. Before the storm breaks on earth in heaven, there is that rainbow that is seen by John as he's caught up in the heaven. And there was a rainbow about his throne in the sight like unto an emerald. May I remind us, it indicates his covenant never to destroy this earth by flood. But you'll find in the Second Peter 3 text, that the earth will be destroyed by fire. And that day is coming. That day is approaching. But the closer we get to that, the closer we are to that day of the rapture of the church when we as believers will be snatched out of this old world. May I remind us not only we see the heavenly throne revealed, but notice the heavenly throng, that is the group of people reviewed in verses 4 through 8. First of all, notice the priestly congregation, verse 4, and round about the throne, that is literally encircling the throne, were four and twenty seats. That is the same word there for thronos, thrones. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns, of gold. We'll not take time to turn to it, but you could go back in the Old Testament in First Chronicles, the 24th chapter. David had appointed 24 elders to represent the priesthood before the throne. Here we see the 24 elders, and I believe they're symbolic of all the church age redeemed, the saints of God that's around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those that are blood-bought, Bible-saved, born again, are represented here in this text. Notice, first of all, they're redeemed, white raiments, White raiments. Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9 points out the white raiment that we will be in as we're around the table with the Lord Jesus Christ in the marriage supper of the Lamb. In chapter 19, Revelation, the sixth verse and following, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a mighty uh, thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife is made ready herself and to 
her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. May I remind us as we see this text, we see those that are around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ are redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. Those that have said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. Those that have been blood-bought, Bible-saved, redeemed ones. May I remind us, we'll be in that number. If you've said yes to Jesus, you'll be in that number. The bride of Christ is pure, spotless, redeemed. We're redeemed, not just church members being in heaven. Listen, may I simply take a moment and digress and say this. There are a lot of people across America and I believe around the globe today that are comfortable in their denominationalism. They're comfortable because they're Baptist. They're comfortable because they're Presbyterian or whatever denomination it may be. They're comfortable in their rites and the rituals and the rules and the regulations of their dogma that they believe is going to take them to heaven. Listen, you can take every Baptist in the world. You can take every other denomination and all of the dogma and the rites, the rituals, rules, and the regulations and die and go to a devil's hell with all of that in your pocket. We cannot be saved by rights, that's R-I-T-E-S, rules and regulations. We're saved by volitional choice to say yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. And these that are around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory are those that have been redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do we see they're redeemed, but they're rewarded. They had on their heads, the scripture says, crowns of gold. Crowns of gold, literally crown, indicating a reward. We will rule and reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that reward will be being faithful. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we'll be rewarded based on what we've done after salvation in our service and submission and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We'll be rewarded based on what we've done in service. John's encouraging the believers here. You may be persecuted now. You may be in a battle now, but one day victory will be ours. The reward will be ours as a result of going through this old world in the battle of life. This is the reason the Apostle Paul said in 2, Thessalonians, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, 7, and 8, I've fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. Salvation being saved is not the end of that which we're to do. When we're saved, the battle just begins. Anybody that thinks that you can get saved and everything's going to be, as the little boy says, hunky-dory, I don't even know if that's in the dictionary or not. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's going to be okay. No, Satan just begins the battle of tearing and tormenting and trying to tear down and to destroy everything that Christ wants to do in your life and in mine. We need to understand that we need to say yes to Jesus Christ. Someone said, and I've repeated it a number of times down through the years, in life, every person, whether they're lost or saved, will go through the same potholes in life. But the Christian has a holy shock, shock absorber. It's called Jesus. That as we go over those potholes and problems and difficulties, we can face them not alone but with Christ. May I remind us, there's a celebration in heaven that's taking place. In fact, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, the scripture talks about some of that celebration. It's further because keep in mind we put verse and chapter divisions in the Bible. God didn't. So we do not find it broken up as we find it in uh, the scripture in the Old and the New Testament. But let's just look at chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 quickly. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts, and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. We'll be singing around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we stand there before the throne, we're singing praise and honor and adoration before him because he's redeemed us. He's bought us with the rich red royal blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do we see the celebration, but notice the priestly and the priestly congregation, but notice the presiding controller, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded, proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. 
That sounds like the Old Testament, doesn't it? In fact, you go back in Exodus chapter 19, and you'll find the same setting, the same scene in this sense. Because in Exodus chapter 19 is where the giving of the law was taking place. And there was the presence of God. And there was the lightning and the thunderings and the rumbling and the darkness that was shattering over the mountainside as the law was being given. May I remind us it's indi indicative there of God's pronouncing judgment here. And that judgment is about to be unleashed upon a Christ-rejecting, God-hating society in that time called the tribulation. The Lord Jesus Christ is the presiding controller of this whole world. He's the one that's in control. And he's about to judge the world. And it's pointing out his power and authority to place that judgment. He is the presiding controller of this whole world. Not only do we see the uh, priestly congregation and the presiding controller, but I want you to notice the patient creatures here are the caretakers. Verse 5, And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, I have probably read some of the most heretical uh, statements about this that anybody would ever read in a commentary. I've probably read behind several hundred theologians so-called on the book of the Revelation. I recall when I first preached through the book of the Revelation verse by verse and chapter by chapter, I got to a few of the verses like this, and I paused and discontinued the series until I was satisfied with what the text was saying. There are some that go into all kind of elaborate details about what this is saying. And I want us to understand when it talks about here the seven spirits before the throne, I want us to realize what it is saying and what it is not saying at all. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Then it tells who they are, which are the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits, the seven living creatures, the seven angelic beings, if you will. In fact, you need not turn to it. But let me just validate some things fire hearing. In chapter 1 and at about verse 4, I believe it is, we read these words. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before pros in front of his throne. And I could go throughout the scripture and time will not allow us to do so. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1, Revelation 4, 5, Revelation 5, 6, Revelation 7, 2, Revelation 8, 2, Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, Revelation 15, 5, Revelation 16, 1, Revelation 10, 1, Psalms 104 and verse 4, etc., etc., infinitum. Scripture interprets scripture. We don't have to wonder who these seven spirits are. It is very, very clear in the scripture. In fact, in Revelation chapter 3 and in verse 1, the scripture tells us this. And unto the angel, the angelos, the messenger of the church in Sardis, write, These things saith he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works and thou art the name that thou livest and art dead. Simply put, these seven spirits, these seven living creatures standing before a cross in front of the throne. Here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's on the throne. Here are the seven spirits cross in front of before the throne. And several have said in the commentators that this is talking about the sevenfold manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's never referred to in the multiplicity any place in the Word of God. These seven spirits are the seven angelos, the seven angels, the seven beings that standing with bated breath with the vials of wrath that will be given instruction throughout the balance of the book of the Revelation to go and pour your wrath out, to blow the trumpet, the trumpet, the seven trumpets, the seven seals, the seven bowls of wrath are found, the 21 judgments in the book of the Revelation. And here are these seven spirits that standing before the throne. They are the ones that are patient uh, uh, caretakers there that's waiting for the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ to give them instruction on what will be taking place in the destruction of this old world through the wrath of God being poured out. I don't know about you, but I am excited to see that God already has it all under control. He knows what's going to be done, how it's going to be done, and when it will take place. And yet we find chaos in the society today for the most part as we're living. The fourth thing we see is the praising creatures, verse 6, 7, and 8. And before, that again is the little word pros, in front of the throne. That's the area uh, where the seven angels are standing. There was a great sea, sea of glass like unto crystal. And it's not talking about water. It is talking about that sea of glass. It's talking about the uh, perfect perfection in its looks. It's talking about the uh, glassy finish, if you please, that is there before and around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a sea of glass like unto crystal. 
crystal, indicating the as appearance, not material, but it's smooth, clear, brilliant, uh, uh, pure, peaceful, and colorful there before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice the scripture says, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were found four beasts. It's the zoon. We got our word zoos or zoo. That means life, living creatures, full of eyes before and behind, literally all seeing, verse 7, and the first beast, angel, angelos, messenger, was likened to a lion that is all-powerful, and the second beast had a face as, wasn't the face of a man, but as a man, that's literally a look of intelligence, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle that is ever-present. Then in verse 8 we find, And the four beasts had uh, each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and, the re and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Listen to what the scripture is telling us. These are the angels that are surrounding the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they worship the Lord Jesus Christ day and night. They are the seraphim and the cherubim that the scripture speaks about. If you please, they are the guardians, the overseers of the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, you can study in the Isaiah text in Isaiah chapter 6 and following. You can look at Isaiah chapter 6 and it talks about those cherubim, those seraphim that are around the cherubim of the cherubim, each having six wings that indicates their speed with which they are going to carry out God's wishes and God's directives for them. Let me just give you a little thought in relationship to verse 8. These burning ones, the seraphim, they're referred to as the burning ones. That is, they're the servants of God. They have six wings. Someone said, and I think it is so apropos in relationship to this, two wings covering for, indicating the subjection to God, covering the faces. Two wings covering the feet that indicate submission to God. Two wings flying that indicate service to God. And all together they're saying, in the thrice holy God, holy, holy, holy. It is talking about the completeness of the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ himself seated upon the throne. Notice their function is to bring honor and glory and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ. They're uh, about to execute God's judgment upon the world, and they're praising the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice a couple of things. First of all, we see their ceaseless praise, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy. The cherubim and the seraphim, the guardians over the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. Day and night, 24-7 as we'd call it in the vernacular today. They worship the Lord Jesus Christ. They're singing praises and they're absolutely devoted to the praise for his holiness as they are around the throne of Jesus, praising him, the thrice holy God, praising Jesus, and may I remind us, one day we will be in that chorus singing with those angels, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. In fact, Adrian Rogers calls these angels God's cheerleaders, <laughs> God's cheerleaders around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, praising the Lord. Notice not only the ceaseless praise, but notice their celebration praise. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Who is that Lord God Almighty, which was and is to come? Who is that speaking of the Lord God Almighty, which was and is, present tense, and is to come? It is celebrating the Lord Jesus Christ. It is celebrating who he is. And in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus himself identifies him himself as the Lord, the Almighty One, which uh, was and is and is to come. It is speaking of Jesus Christ as being God seated on the throne, and we will be around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping him. May I remind us, Jesus is coming again. He's coming for his bride. He's going to appear in the sky, and he's going to call us unto himself. Come up hither, and that door is open, giving us full access to the very throne room of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the heavenly throne revealed. We see the heavenly throng reviewed. But I want us to notice in verse 9, 10, and 11, the heavenly theme recorded. The heavenly theme recorded. Notice verse 9 and 10, what I call the prostrate celebration. Notice the scripture says, And when those beasts, creatures, angelic beings, give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and forever, 
the four and the twenty elders fall, fall down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and forever and cast their crowns before him, cast their crowns before the throne saying, listen to what the scripture is saying. We see the celebration taking place. The Lord Jesus Christ, let me remind us again, is about to judge the world in the tribulation time. We're in glory around the throne of the Lord Jesus, joining in the heavenly chorus with the heavenly singers singing praises to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see in this text the church-age saints are all present. The entire heavenly throng sings and celebrates and falls down before the throne and worship is Jesus, we're in worship of Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. We see two things there, their position and their praise. In prostration on their faces at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today there seems to be an arrogancy, a stiff-necked attitude with most today. Even among so many Christians, there seems to be the attitude that I can worship if I please, I can go to church when I want to, I can stay out when I want to, I can do as I please and go as I please with the arrogant attitude that it doesn't make any difference at all. I'm here to announce to you that one day, if we're truly saved, if we're blood-bought, Bible-saved, born again, we'll have no problem bending the knee and bowing before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ and singing praise and honor and glory and dedication and submission and surrender under his lordship throughout all of eternity. Their position is in bowed prostrate position before the throne. The arrogancy we see today, the stiff neckness. Some have spiritual pride today, dishonoring God, living as they please without bending the knee and bowing before the throne. Notice not only their position, but their praise. Verse 10, the latter portion, and worship him that liveth forever and forever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, crowns, our rewards in heaven will have no value other than casting them at the feet of the one that gave them back to Jesus Christ himself. The praise and the worship, worshiping the one, praising the one, the creator, controller, savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that's coming one day and coming very soon. One grand glorious day will be gathered around the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ in the celebration, the praise, and the honor of Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. As David Ring said earlier in his uh, uh, brief message in song, that old song, what a glorious day that will be when Jesus we shall see. The uh, song says, and I looked upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. I don't know about you, but it should cause every Christian to rejoice in the realization, the recognition of what we have in our salvation that's so full and free. The privilege and the opportunity, one glorious day that we'll have, being able to sing praises before the throne of Jesus Christ that died on Calvary's cross for you and for me. We will sing what a day, Glorious day that will be. Look at that 11th verse. The scripture says then, ending the phrase in verse 10, we before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and praise for because thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Listen to what the scripture is saying. Listen, one day we're going to worship the Lord Jesus Christ casting our crowns before him as we're seated before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. We worship Jesus as Redeemer, his pure, spotless, the pure, spotless lamb that became the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. It is the worship of all of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout all of eternity. It is the worship of all those whose lives have been cleansed by the precious blood of the Lamb, singing praises and honor and glory for Jesus Christ. Part of that song will be, as we found in the previous reading of chapter 5, verse 8, 
and 9. I'll read that in closing. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and the twenty elders fell down before the, thro before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. We're going to sing a new song in glory. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals. Therefore, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and hath made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on earth. May I remind us, ladies and gentlemen, there's coming a day, a grand and glorious day that we'll be caught up to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll stand before his throne and we'll bow before him and cast our crowns before him and we'll be singing that song, Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. There's some as I am that cannot sing a tune today. But one day we'll be singing throughout all of eternity. The question begs to be asked and demands to be answered. Will you be in that number? Will you be standing before the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know for sure that you're saved? Do you know sometime, someplace, sometime back, you said yes to Jesus Christ? You invited him to come into your heart, forgive you your sins, and save you. If there's doubt, I always say do. I would beg with you, plead with you today, do not leave this place lest you're sure of that relationship to Jesus Christ. Life is too short. Death is too sure. Eternity is too long. Hell is too real to doubt your relationship to Jesus Christ. One day, if we've said yes to Jesus Christ, we'll be standing before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ, singing praises to the one that created us and saved us, and we'll live with him for eternity. Would you stand, please? As we stand together, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, as the music plays, as the Holy Spirit of God speaks. Oh, to thee, my blessed Savior.